In my business, being outdoors, raising livestock, what I've observed just in the last summer and the summer before that, most recently, is that it's unsustainable. The temperatures that are, we've risen to in, in uh, South Texas, near Laredo, uh, when I first started doing this in the um, mid-70s, uh, I think in August of, of 1976, there was one day when the temperature was above 100 degrees. Mm. Just this past August, 2019, there was one day when it, when it wasn't above um, 100 degrees, and most of the days were, were 105 to 108 degrees anyway. The point is, is that it's, this is unsustainable for, for, for livestock, for horses, for chickens, for even for people working outdoors. It involves taking some short-term economic pain, right, and, and some, some policies that, that are restrictive in terms of what people you know, can do and should do with the environment, including probably cattle, which are part of the methane problem. You know, how can how you as a, as a presidential um, candidate, if you were to get the nominee, enlist the support of, of voters to, to change their minds, to do something immediately that's not really in their interest? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for, for bringing up this issue, Austin, and especially from your perspective, which we don't hear enough um, as somebody who's in the agriculture industry. Um, but it's a powerful reminder that, that in so many different ways, we have an opportunity to confront this climate crisis. And uh, I put out a plan a few weeks ago on how I would do that as president, beginning with the first day in office, recommitting to the Paris Climate Accord, and then setting a goal of getting to net zero carbon emissions in the United States by 2045, and leading so that at latest we can get there around the world by 2050. We would do that in many different ways, you know, setting a clean energy standard, a clean transportation standard, incentivizing agriculture to adopt more env environmentally friendly practices, um, putting in place a carbon fee and a number of other steps that would help us get there. And then to address this challenge of, um, okay, well, are there sacrifices that we need to make? I actually believe that we can both do right by our planet and also unleash a clean energy revolution in terms of jobs. Like uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Newton, Iowa, and Newton used to have a Maytag washing machine manufacturing facility, and then it closed. But today, there's a company called TPI that manufactures wind turbines. And I visited TPI. They're employing several hundred people, paying decent wages, uh, and, you know, but They're part of this clean energy revolution. But even with um, a lot of the changes that we're seeing in solar and wind, it cannot in the short term make up for the traditional sources of energy. And I'm wondering if you see a move to nuclear, for example. Um, are there other places where um, we should be looking for our energy that might not be um, coal and oil and gas? Well, absolutely. We need to move away from uh, coal, oil, and gas and phase out nuclear. Uh, nuclear is definitely preferable when it comes to carbon emissions versus those other three. And the way that I think about it is sort of this worst first approach, you know, working on immediately getting the worst of, of uh, the types of uh, energy that produces carbon emissions out first. I have set a goal in my plan of getting us to an electricity sector that is clean, renewable, and zero emissions by uh, 2035. And, you know, nuclear has a role in that, but, but I don't think that it has the primary role. I think ultimately renewables will have the primary role. And in Texas last month, uh, for the first time ever, more uh, energy was generated in Texas from wind than from coal. So this is already happening, and we do need improvements in things like battery storage for wind and solar. Uh, and so, yes, we're not completely there yet but we're moving there very rapidly.